Our next speaker has commanded at all levels to include Commander of the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division, Commanding General, 1st Infantry Division, and Commanding General 3 Corps. He has many operational deployments to include multiple tours and operations, Iraqi freedom, and inherent resolve. He now serves as the Commanding General of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. It is my pleasure to introduce General Paul E. Funk II. Joe Ryan, can you hear me? It is great to see you, brother, and th thanks for what you've done out there in the Pacific. What a tremendous job you're doing in Hawaii. Thank you. It's great to see all the division commanders here. Johnny, great to see you. I saw Charlie earlier. And so I, I really, uh, Lori, there she is. Okay, great. Hey, listen, this is about our profession. This is about uh, what matters in, in our force. This is uh, an incredible opportunity. So one of the most impactful jobs I had in an almost 40 year career was uh, the eight months I spent as the S3 Air and 2-8 Cavalry as my first assignment in the Army. And the S3 was a guy named John Antall. That is a true story. He was uh, legendary in his thought, in, in his forward thinking, and how we trained our force. He was part of the force that brought in the new way of training, and that was in 1987. So, John, thanks for coming. Thanks for giving back to our great profession, and thanks for being part of this. Uh, Pat, thanks for having this conference, and thanks for fighting so hard to make sure we could bring uh, all these uh, men and women together. Uh, you're going to hear from Ian Sullivan, one of the smartest guys at TRADOC, by the way. We're lucky to have him, Ian. Thanks for coming. And uh, for those, our allies and partners, thanks for your contributions to this, too. You know, we're in this together. We will never fight as a guy who's now led um, multiple coalition fights in uh, 20 years, the last 20 years. We will never fight without our allies and partners, and frankly, we need them. We absolutely need their perspective. We need their thought. We need their uh, determination. And frankly, uh, once in a while, we need their plain speak. Uh, so uh, I have some prepared remarks here, and I'll, I'll go through those, but uh, I will answer some questions at the end. I think the moderator, that handsome rascal over there on my left, is going to take questions, I think. But uh, know this. Uh, I talked to the chief last night, and he had a very simple message to all of you who are leading our operational force. If, get ready. This is a serious time in our country. Be ready. And if you say it, do it. Focus. Drive change. But the chief will tell you, be ready. What you're seeing on TV is happening. Be ready for all of us, the total force. So, good morning. I'm honored to be with you here today in the great state of Georgia on a historic Fort Benning, just a stone's throw from the mighty Chattahoochee River, home of the Maneuver Center. And I want to share with you this impressive, this impressive group of leaders, how we are recruiting, training, educating, and developing the best soldiers and leaders of tomorrow and how people and how people are and will always be our asymmetric advantage. For those of you who don't know me out there in radio TV land, my name's Funk and I'm an American soldier. When I joined the army in 1984, I was a flat bellied freedom fighter who had just graduated with a fish and wildlife degree from Montana State University. Yes fish all day, and wildlife all night. I loved driving around in my black regal listening to hits like Eye of the Tiger and watching the A-Team. And Pat Michaelis told me, if you don't remember the show, you probably remember the famous catchphrase. I love it when a plan comes together. As I was transitioning from driving a Buick to the most intimidating vehicle on earth, the M1 Abrams tank, little did I know that I was joining an army that was going through one of the most challenging modernization and reform efforts in our history. 
to, to frame the strategic landscape that led to these reforms, senior leaders were contending with the develop developmental neglect in new weaponry due to decades of fighting in Vietnam. In the mid 70s, the Soviet Union was building up of forces at dangerously threatening levels in Central Europe. In the 80s, the Cold War was reaching its peak and the nuclear threat of nuclear war had reached heights not seen since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. China was undergoing a cultural and revolutionary combined revolution combined with a political and economic reform that had resulted in China being our nation's leading pacing threat today. The political and strategic currents coupled with the pervasive realities of a powerful and dangerous Soviet adversary were leading factors that drove army leaders to spearhead one of our, the most major reorganizations of tactical units in military history. The army had no choice but to find ways to balance heavy and light organizational design to, make, to meet the emerging threats in the future. The concept of air land battle doctrine was developed in 1982, which among other major changes resulted in the creation of special mission units like the Ranger Regiment and the big five weapon systems such as the Abrams tank. This was the beginning of a revolution in Dotlam PF. The Army revamped officer and enlisted personnel management policies and training philosophy. We founded combat training centers and the after action review process, which allowed us to, to, look, to look critically at all elements of Dotlam PF. One of the Army's most impactful changes during that period was the professionalization of the NCO Corps, exemplar of our great Sergeant Major of the Army and the TRADOC Sergeant Major sitting here today. And then we transitioned to the all-volunteer force, setting us on a path to being the most envied and feared Army in the world. When you analyze the strategic leadership or landscape over the last decades, many familiar trends begin to appear. The U.S. has dealt with strategic withdrawal of the ground force from the long wars we waged in Iraq and Afghanistan. We are forced to contend with continuing budget resolutions and extreme fiscal realities requiring the Army to do more with less. Coming to the ends of decades of fighting and training in counterinsurgency requires our Army to return to its strengths, which is large-scale combat operations, and once again, modernize our weapons, doctrine, and education to keep pace with emerging threats. While we all acknowledge the need for change, we must also be careful to remember the hard-fought lessons of the past decades of conflict and ensure that we consider them as we develop plans for the future. While we were returning to our dominant roots, our adversaries have also embarked on their own modernization efforts. China has emerged as the United States' pacing threat. They are modernizing across Dotland PF, which includes a focus on professionalizing their PME and modernizing their training to be more realistic. For context, they've established six national training centers with a professional op four that uses our doctrine. What they, have la what they lack in combat experience, they are trying to make up for by lessons learned from our training and doctrine. As you can uh, tell from current events, Russia is clearly an acute and growing threat they already have a trained officer corps. Although their resources available are less than China's, they also have a national training centers with an op board that uses their own tactics. They are working to professionalize their long neglected NCO corps and are executing large scale national exercises that are larger than any equivalent US exercise conducted to date. They too are taking the lessons learned of the past and developing capabilities to meet future challenges to compete with the U.S. So how can we, as an Army and member of the Joint Force, adapt to meet ch future challenges? What must change structurally and doctrinally? First, as we transition our focus from counterinsurgency to large-scale combat operations, emerging threats now require the Army to transition from brigade combat teams to divisions as the Army's principal tactical warfighting echelon. 
Second, we are developing doctrine for a new era. Multi-domain operations is the Army's operational doctrine that describes how the Army, as part of the Joint Force, will leverage its soldiers and emerging technologies to compete with and defeat near-peer adversaries. Conceptually, MDO reflects an evolutionary change that sensitizes the Army's three previous operational approaches. Airland battle contributes to the idea of the extended battlefield. Full spectrum operation provides the basis for conducting operations outside of traditional armed conflict. And the unified land operation establishes the requirement for the Army to synchronize its efforts with its joint and international partners. In practice, MDL will revolutionize how the Army conducts combined arms maneuver. The recent draft of Field Manual 3.0 operations, which is set to be published in June of this year, introduces MDO. MDO expands the principle of combined arms maneuver across all domains. Implementing it will entail creating a convergence of effects to create exploitable windows of opportunity for the joint force. The goal is to integrate cross-domain capabilities in such a way that to inter interact or counteract one, the enemy must become vulnerable in another. This creates opportunities and provides options to deter, de-escalate, or promptly transition to win the first battle. Now, even more than ever, first battles will be critical to the outcome of the campaigns and crucial if we hope to avoid protracted conflicts. Preparation to win future first battles requires a paradigm shift in how soldiers and leaders proactively view threats and understand the operational environment. The Army of 2030 requires soldiers and leaders who are highly trained, disciplined, and fit with the knowledge, skills, and behaviors to operate advanced technological systems to fight in multi-domain environments. Under austere conditions, FM 70 describes the transformation in the Army's training approach to enable MDO in large-scale combat operations. It is every leader's responsibility to understand our doctrine and prioritize tasks across the full spectrum of conflict. Our antiquated training model of solely relying on live training exercises at CTCs will not provide the number of repetitions required to achieve, to achieve task mastery and compete in today's operational environment. Our legacy training systems are insufficient to meet the emerging needs of the force because they simply can't replicate the scale and complexity of MDO. We are innovating on solutions to bring the training to the soldier, not the soldier to the training. At TRADOC, we're also working with uh, Futures Command to develop and employ 21st century technologies to build training readiness for the 21st century warfare. We are doing this by expanding training into the synthetic training environment through convergence of live, virtual, and constructive training environments into one holistic system. This type of training relies on simulations capable of preparing all soldiers on a digital map called One World Terrain, which will, will replace nearly 60 individual terrain databases currently in use. We're updating over 900,000 training aids, 4,100 ranges, and nearly 6,500, 6.5 million acres of training area. These new updates will enable leaders at all levels to train their soldiers on their weapon systems at home station, as well as at our combat, combat training centers. The synthetic training environment will prepare the force to operate in uncertain, complex situations that, that develop creativity, adaptability, critical thinking, and independent decision-making to compete in future warfare. My mentor, and a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Marty Dempsey, codified the concept of Mission Command in 2012. But the concept becomes paramount in MDO. Our adversaries will use standoff capabilities to separate the elements of the joint force and divide us from allies and partners. Advances in our adversaries' technology 
technological capabilities and operational concepts may result in circumstances where our forces are temporarily outgunned, outmanned, outranged, or outmaneuvered. Degraded communications resulting from an adversary cyber or space disruptions will further isolate forces on the battlefield. The interaction of physical and cognitive isolation suggests that the Army of 2030 must be able to operate distributed across larger battlefields with no safe havens and less direct communications between soldiers and leaders. In this uncertain environment, junior leaders will, be, will need to make operationally relevant decisions within the culture of mission command while on the move. It is imperative for commanders to understand the problem, visualize and describe the operation, and clearly articulate intent to subordinates, and then trust subordinates to achieve the intent. To enable mission command, training must replicate the distributed, chaotic, and mobile nature of the modern battlefield, where forces will need to aggregate and disaggregate on the move. That means commanders must embrace and train on tools that will enable mission command, such as this synthetic training environment. Envision putting on a virtual tactical glass and entering a digital universe where your avatar is able to attend a virtually augmented commander's update from anywhere on the battlefield and discuss operationally, operational objectives over a 3D terrain model. That is where we're going. If you have seen movies like Ready Player One and recent announcements by Mark Zuckerberg about the metaverse and, and the augmented reality, that is the future. We need to embrace technology and be able to operate in ambiguity because as candidly stated by General Shinseki, if you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevance less. Changes in the operational environment are outpacing our traditional methods of evaluating holistic fitness. Soldiers will require higher levels of psychological and cognitive endurance to operate in large scale operations. The Holistic Health and Fitness Initiative in the Army's new readiness system that combines elements of physical and non-physical readiness and fitness. The H2F system provides customized programs of education, coaching, mentoring, and outreach to restore, improve, and maintain readiness and overall resiliency. We have expanded our measures beyond physical readiness to include mental health, sleep, nutrition, spiritual readiness to improve soldiers' overall fit, health and fitness. Although no one would argue that to fight and win in the future we'll need to embrace technology, we cannot forget that our true asymmetric advantage is our soldiers. 71% of the earth is comprised of water. However, 100% of the people live on land. Throughout history, from the Great War to the Global War on Terror, our national leaders and sister services have claimed that the naval forces and strategic bombardment could win wars. The lessons of history would tell us a different story. For example, during the Battle of Iwo Jima, the U.S. conducted 72 straight days of vicious naval and air bombardment to weaken enemy forces. What we failed to anticipate was that the enemy had con constructed well-fortified underground structures to withstand heavy artillery. Despite near-constant bombardment of the island, it, took, it still took ground forces 36 days of fighting and the loss of 7,000 U.S. Marines with 20,000 wounded to secure the victory. We can't become overly com confident that technology alone will win future wars. There is a cultural and human dimension to war that drives nations deep-seated will to survive despite the complexity of the weapons used against them. People are resilient. The Battle of Iwo Jima is only one example of how we have tried to prioritize technology over people to win our nation's wars. We have tried these things before. Effects-based operations, net-centric warfare, but the reality is we, can, we can't technology our way out of war. 
we win or lose based on the honed nature of our fighting forces. By honed, I mean highly trained, well rehearsed, and led by leaders that can operationalize our doctrine and apply our training tenets. We must fight outnumbered and win. Systems matter only as much as the world-class force that understands their application. At the end of the day, we go to war with the systems and the people we have at the time, so it's important to ensure we have highly trained, disciplined, and fit troops. It is those brave soldiers, not superior technology, that is key to maintaining our asymmetric advantage. To meet the future needs of the Army, our nation's biggest challenge, and I need your help with, is, the all is preserving the all-voluntary force. The all-voluntary Army is at risk. America's population growth is stagnating, which has resulted in a recruiting pool shrinking. Only 23% of 18 to 24 year olds are eligible to enlist, but even fewer have the propensity to serve. Historically, less than 1% of the American citizens choose to serve in the military. Almost 80% of those who do enlist have a close family member who previously served in the military. Only 38% of kids aged tw six to 12 play any team sports. And 70% of those quit by the time they're 13. What this means is that the vast majority of American kids do not see the Army as a viable career. Most who do are physically unfit and ineligible to join. And many who join don't really understand what it means to be part of a team. With the lack of motivation to serve, we find ourselves in the middle of a growing war on talent. In fact, it may prove to be one of the most challenging battles the Army has ever engaged in. The desire to serve continues to decline and is at an all-time low. A large part of the reason for this is that America isn't connected to its Army anymore. Another reason is the misinformation that the American public hears about our Army that negatively influences America's youth to serve. We need to do a better job of getting out and telling our Army story. We need to communicate to the public that the Army should be the first choice, not the last. The Army can provide a life of meaningful service that also provides lifelong benefits. I need every one of you to commit to telling your Army story to help connect our citizens and attract talent in our Army. It could very well prove to be the most important story you'll ever tell. I want to close by saying developing MDO capable soldiers ensures the Army is ready for future challenges. We will maintain our advantage by developing leaders and soldiers capable of outperforming our adversaries physically, cognitively, and societally. Ultimately, the Army needs to have the right people with the right skills and a culture that underwrites the Army's operational effectiveness. It needs soldiers who are highly trained, disciplined and fit and diverse. With great soldiers and quality leaders, our Army is unstoppable. As I approach the end of my, my time in the Army, I pass the baton to you. This is your Army. It's your job to continue the legacy of those who wore and continue to wear the cloth of our great nation and to add to that legacy when given the opportunity to be stewards to the future. Now is your opportunity. You are now responsible for leading change and fostering a culture grounded in dignity and respect. To paraphrase Admiral Winnefield, the former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we didn't hire you to bide your time. You're going to wake up one day and it's going to be over faster than you think. Make a difference now. Have an idea, challenge those ideas, drive change. We all have the great responsibility of honoring those who came before us in service by leaving the jersey of the greatest team on earth, the uniform that we get the privilege to wear, leaving that in a better place 
while we have the opportunity. As stated by famed New Zealand all-black rugby coach Graham Henry, you don't own the jersey. You're just the body in the jersey at the time. Stay humble, stay kind, and lead with empathy. Embrace future technologies, adapt to change. But lest we forget, soldiers will always be our asymmetric advantage. As I said when I started, my name is Funk, and I'm an American soldier. And victory starts right here. Thank you. Sir, as the MC, I'll, I'll, I'll field the first question. We will be able to field questions from the virtual attendees via our chat box, and we have two mics in the room for any of the uh, in-person attendees. Sir, my question is, if the big idea of air land battle in the 1980s and 90s was to use our superior training, leadership, and equipment to win the first battle of a war between NATO and the USSR and the Plains of Europe, do you see a similar big idea for the operationalization of MDO for us in the future? I think it, uh, I, frankly, um, I think the proof is in the pudding uh, as Airland Battle was Desert Storm, right? And what it did to the Iraqi army. So if you consider those applications and then the, the advancement of the technology and the convergence of the effects that we're trying to approve throughout the domains, I believe that uh, we, that gives us an advantage. But it's only as good, as I said when it started here, is it's only as good as the soldiers and leaders and frankly, it all revolves around our training. The most important thing we can do for the young men and women of America to get them prepared to go to war is to train them constantly and make sure that they understand how to apply the elements of combat power across the spectrum of conflict. Thanks, sir. Do we have any questions uh, from inside Marshall? All right, so we have a question from our virtual, uh, we have a question in the room? Okay, from our virtual participants. How is the Army adapting its recruiting process and identifying future soldiers who reflect our society and will embrace our values and thrive on a multi-domain operations battlefield? How? How, sir? Well, frankly, we were going to, <laughs> well, we're going to an individual recruiting mission for our recruiters. We're actually getting our senior leaders out to tell their army story to help uh, so that people can reconnect to their uh, to their roots. Frankly, the, the more we get out and tell our story, the sooner the, the more uh, propensity to serve is in the nation. The nation needs to be inspired now. That's what this uniform means across the globe, right? Two things, hope and fear. And we need to get out and show it. We need to talk to people. We can't assume that they understand what we do. I have literally been asked um, just this year. I'm not gonna, I've, I've, these are statements I have heard or have been said to me directly this year. I'm not gonna let my son join because you send people of color to the front lines first. I also have had people ask me point blank, whatever happened to go to, you know, go to jail or go to the army? Frankly, we don't need that kind of problem. But these are things still in our nation. So if we were not, if we're not getting out to tell our story, that's what the American people are going to think. I was with a, a just a quick, um, just a quick sway, segue. I was with a uh, a leader of the Southeastern Conference. I was at Fort Jackson. We were driving around. He had just been to the. He got up in the morning, saw the the, the patching ceremony, which brings tears to your eyes. And uh, I didn't even see you, Dave Hodney. You're camouflaged. Good to see you, man. And so um, he was, uh, he'd been to the patching ceremony. He saw the emotion that comes when that drill sergeant puts that patch on that young man or woman who's gone through the most uh, impactful thing in his or her life and says, hey, here's your beret and here's your patch and now you're a soldier. And it brings tears to their eyes and they weep. That's how important it is to them. But he's driving around, he's looking all over, and he's saying, hey. I said, Greg, what are you looking at? He said, hey, where's the World War II wood barracks? And where are the guys spinning their rifles and things? His mindset, this is a leader of, uh, uh, in our nation that's got impactful. 
His mindset was stripes. Think about that, okay? If we're out telling our story, if we're not, if we're not, if we're out interacting with the public, they don't that, but this is his. That's we gotta change that condition. We must. Go ahead. Well, frankly, we've got to have different type methods of training the cognitive piece. We're, we're really working hard on sleep, and we're working on what it means, uh, you know, what it means uh, in the mental aspects of the approach. Uh, FM 7-22 is our holistic health and fitness manual, and in there it talks about the mental mental readiness of young men and women, the impacts of sleep, the impacts of uh, pushing them, and, and making sure that they they can how they learn and understanding how they adapt. And so it's really trying to educate our, our leaders on how soldiers are learning these days. I think we got a question in the audience, Adam. General, thank you. Matt Kanzel from the UK. Uh, thank you for an inspiring speech. It's great to be on the team with you uh, alongside. General, I'm just really interested in your view uh, of uh, whether our adversaries with both strategic and tactical nuclear missiles, how how you see that as, a, as an overriding feature of, of future combat, of large-scale combat, sir? Well, I think the Soviet or the Russians have a doctrine that uses, uh, they, they actually have the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons in their doctrine, don't they? Yeah, they do. So is that something we have to consider? Absolutely. Um, I think the threat of uh, nuclear annihilation should be considered, frankly. Um, you know, you, can, you, you don't have to use uh, all the elements of national power. One of them is information, right? In the information space, they know we uh, have demonstrated that we will use those. So I think that is uh, that standoff remains intact. Yeah, uh, great question. Frankly, it, becomes, it goes to mission command and understanding intent and then acting, not reacting, okay? We've got to act. Uh, you know, and we've, we've got things across the, you know, I was uh, recounting yesterday at a Purple Heart ceremony the, the, uh, the, the reason the Purple Heart was found, was found was by a guy named Sergeant Brown who acted and flanked the enemy at uh, Redoubt Number Ten at Yorktown, and that that on the battlefield at that time inspired them, inspired the American forces to overrun that. And that's just one account of what it means to act without co with a commander's intent. They knew they needed to take that down. They'd had thousands of, or hundreds of casualties trying to take it down. He knew that that was going to uh, end the battle. And cause the, the the our adversary there to uh, to give up. So he acted across the face of uh, of conflict. We have seen that multiple times. We have to ingrain that, especially because we're going to have to fight dis, uh, disaggregated, and we're going to have to act independently. So mission command is really truly going to be the the tenant that we're going to have to rely on the most. Thanks, sir. Any questions from the room? All right, we have another virtual question, sir, uh, regarding training infrastructure. So how are Army posts and bases going to change to enable training for MDO? When will we start to see modifications or trainings to, to enable this training? Yeah, it's great. I, I think you see, you're starting to see it now. The new, the new uh, um, small arms tables, the new extension of the, of the ranges, uh, the Western Range Complex, out at uh, Fort Huachuca so we can do some training on EW and, and uh, some of the cyber effects. You see the connection of the Western Range Complex and could be a, actually extended into the National Training Center space. Uh, so we're trying to do that now. Uh, frankly, the use of simulations and simulators is gonna be much more paramount. That gives us the repetition we're gonna need. Some of these weapon systems that we're bringing are incredibly costly costly and the ammunition is not cheap either. Consequently, we're gonna to have to be able to use simulations and simulators 
to, uh, to uh, use the effects and train on the use of the systems so that when we do employ them, it's a first time, first kill kind of a scenario. All right, sir, we, we don't have any more questions on virtual attendees. Any more questions in the room? Uh, see no further questions. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Win here. <laughs>